Okay. All right, we're preparing to live stream. Admitting the waiting room. All right. We are live. Hello, everyone. Hello, Cartoon Charente Car. <laughs> That's fun to look at. Um, I am so excited, you guys. Today um, is a special episode of the Rebound Coach Live. And if you are new to virtual space with me, first of all, I'm really glad that you're here. And I normally start with hello, hello. This is Dallas Cohen, the Rebound Coach, and you're watching or listening to an episode of the Rebound Coach Live, a special episode in particular, a special discussion episode. But before we get to our discussion, I'll share just a little bit about myself. If this is your first time sharing space with me and you're like, what is a Rebound Coach? I've never even heard of that. That makes no sense. Okay, got you. <laughs> um, I'm a life coach and life coaches help people get unstuck. I personally serve high achieving women of faith who have lived through betrayal, trauma, or abuse and are reclaiming territory in their relationship with themselves. I got into that, of course, with my own story. Y'all, I was married 10 years to a man who wanted me dead. And uh, that doesn't make sense for somebody like me. I was raised in a good godly home. I had two Christian parents. They loved God. They loved each other. They were married for a lifetime. All the statistics that are supposed to mean nothing bad is going to happen to me. At the same time, I was molested from the time I was eight to the time I was 16. And that radically affects, as a young person, how you see yourself, your building identity in those years, how you relate to God, how I saw God in a household of faith, and how I related to men. Fast forward, when I met the man that I married and eventually divorced, there were definitely red flags. There were definitely reasons not to be together. At the same time, I'm a woman of faith, always have been. And so when I prayed about it, I believed that God said yes. And because I believed that, I believed that whatever came, you know, I knew this wasn't going to be easy, but whatever came, we would outlast it. We'd overcome it. God would swoop in and save the day and change him. And everything was going to be great. Eventually, I just needed to stay and pray and do my part. And um, y'all, trouble came right away and never quite left. We got into a cycle of what I call coping and crisis. So it's where you never quite get to happy. <laughs> you never quite get to good. You're just um, walking on eggshells and learning this dance of how to be very careful and survive. That's coping. And then every so often, some big crisis happens and then upsets everything, everything's on the floor and you're very carefully doing that eggshell dance again. We did that for the larger part of nine years, over nine years, and uh, everything kind of came to a head. End of 2019, beginning of 2020, he left for another woman. He was a serial adulterer. And uh, this time he, I found out him and that woman had been plotting my murder. Um, and had been doing so for months by the time I found out about it. So needless to say, that's kind of a record scratch moment in the movie where you're watching the movie and there's a record scratch moment. Everything is, you know, just stops and you have some serious questions to answer. And, you know, you're, you're threatened on, on every level as a wife, as a mom, as a woman, as a child of God, also as a coach. I had been coaching around marriage and family for about five or six years by that time and had built an entire identity and platform around this idea of covenant and covenant marriage and why staying married was the most important thing and I, I tell the story it's like a teenage pregnancy eventually <laughs> eventually they're gonna find out and um you know over the course of the next several months and a chain of divine encounters divine set of circumstances. I can't even, I can't even explain how put together it was. Not only am I safe and alive, my children are safe. We're learning and growing and deconstructing is the fancy word, but really um, our identity is growing and shifting. And um, we've been able to choose life. You know, I had a choice to make. I could allow the identity that my ex-husband had planned for me. And quite frankly, the one I had 
agreed to tell me who I was, how I was allowed to believe, how I was allowed to live, how many days I had left on the planet, or I could choose life. So I wrote a book out of all of that, <laughs> which is a lot. The name of the book is I Choose Life, Rewrite Your Love Story and Change Your Legacy. And it's not just about my particular, it's a, it's a memoir. So my story is definitely a big part of it. It's not only my story. It is a path to freedom for those who have experienced abuse of any kind. And it's also uh, a manual for those who love people who have experienced abuse. So if there's someone you know and any of my story reminded you of them, this book is for you. You can get the book at thereboundcoach.com forward slash book. And Autumn, if you can put that in the chat for me, that'd be amazing. Thereboundcoach.com forward slash book. Um, also, I didn't realize this, so I, I'm not watching the Facebook Live. Autumn, if you could. <laughs> and just in case there are some comments there um, that someone can respond to because I can't see that and this and I choose this. So <laughs> um, you can find that book at thereboundcoach.com forward slash book. And okay, so that's that's what got us to this, okay? Just telling stories. And I do the Rebound Coach Live once a week. And uh, I have a friend. Okay, so today is July 5th. It is the day after July 4th, Independence Day. And I have an amazing friend that I partner with in doing some amazing things. Her name is Malikia Courtney, and she goes by Coach MK. And one of she does a lot of amazing things, but two things I really admire about her. Number one, she is a community builder to the core. And number two, she's a movement maker. So for her 50th birthday, which is tomorrow, instead of just having a party, because she loves party and she's a great partier, uh, she decided to do something, a social movement. And the name of the movement is called Brave. So if you've seen the advertisements for today, you've seen a Brave Conversation and Brave is capitalized. And it stands for, I'm gonna find it, being ready to advocate voice and empower. It's about standing up for what you believe in and being willing to protect it. And she made this movement and invited all of her friends, um, her mover and shaker friends to host virtual conversations, to post videos, to tell stories about things that mattered and to show some independence, right? So independence is freedom. Independence is I no longer depend on this person, place, thing system. And it was social action oriented and people of color oriented and uh, people pick, you can pick any topic that's important to you. So July 4th um, was never a big deal for me. Uh, I've enjoyed celebrating America's birthday and whatever, right? And I used to hear, I used to hear about um, people who were rabble rousing on that day. And my ex-husband, uh, he was just angry in general. So if he had an opportunity to be angry, he would. <laughs> so this was July 4th. Hey, Rick, yeah. July 4th was another opportunity to be angry. And so, you know, he'd make up injustices if there were none. He'd just make up some just to be angry. And uh, for me, I would take the opposite, the opposite track. Like, uh, I'm not going to rabble rouse just make an excuse to be angry about something. This is an opportunity to be thankful. I'm thankful to live in this country. I'm thankful for what this country represents, some of it anyway, right? So have the opportunity to choose joy, to choose celebration. That was that was the way I was approaching the day until George Floyd. Like something shifted for me. <laughs> something shifted for me with George Floyd. Um, in the way I felt in response to it, in the way I saw my world, right? So we watched the world light on fire, it felt like, but I was watching my communities. I was watching my faith community. I was watching my professional community. I was watching my friend group. I was just watching. I was watching the online community. How was everyone responding? And what it looks like was people that I used to call my people. The way I was raised, the, the group, social group I was raised with, the political group I was raised with, suddenly was behaving very poorly. 
and the way black folks say showing they behind okay <laughs> so um it it was suddenly like i can't believe that this is the response and um it just lit something in me it lit something in me and so when i thought about this brave campaign when i thought about this movement and how i would represent it what i would bring there's a lot when we think about communities of color black community in particular because that's the one i'm from that's the one i think about the most when i consider what i might share what we can talk about that would move the needle forward for us you know there's a lot of options and to me it looks like there's two different ways you can go about it you can look at uh all these problems that somebody else can solve right if the police acted this way if the politicians did this if the corporations did that if these other people behaved a different way that would solve the problem or you could look at things that we can solve by we i mean the people in the group so when i think about that and i think about stuff that's not often talked about out loud and in any action oriented way I think about the infiltration, the infestation of childhood sexual abuse in the Black community, in the uh, BIPOC community, or the people of color, all the way around. Really, really everyone, because it it affects everyone. Um, but in for this conversation, for the for the purpose of this conversation, I just want to share a couple of statistics with you. When my mother was growing up. It's another reason why it's really important to me. So my great grandmother, uh, we used to live in the South. She was raped by a white man and had my grandmother. Um, and then, you know, headed up north. She was a slave headed up north. That's only two generations ago. Three, like my great grandmother was a slave. Then uh, my grandmother was born and she had sexual childhood sexual abuse in her childhood. She birthed my mother who had severe childhood sexual abuse, severe. And then my mother birthed me. And I shared part of my story with you where I had sexual abuse for eight years straight. And that's only the story, that's that's the one story I tell, there's more. Um, that's just the one that I tell the most frequently. And I remember when my parents, when I told my parents, I've told my parents a year into that eight year stretch, let that sink in. I told my parents one year into the eight year stretch. And I think they did the best they could. I believe they did the best they could. They prayed with me. Uh, they prayed about generational curses and told me that both of them had histories and that this was a generational curse. And so they prayed to break the curse and sent me on my way. And that was pretty much it. Then they called my abuser down, which was a foster brother, which later he became a legal brother. They adopted him. So if that gives you any indication, they they called him down and talked to him. The abuse stopped for about a week, then picked up again and went on until he left the house. Um, I wish that I could say that my story is unique, but it's not. So when my mother was growing up, it was um, one in every four girls uh, in her community. One in every four girls were being uh, abused and molest molestation, incest, rape, sexual abuse, it's all under the same category. Um, we use terms that make us feel comfortable, but they are all in the same category. And so at that time, it was one in four. Today, it is two in four in the black community in particular. That means half of us, half of us. Um, some stats we pulled up, estimates of prevalence of childhood sexual abuse, how often it occurs ranges from eight to 31% of girls and three to 17.6% of boys internationally. And 12.2 to 26.6% of girls and 5.1 to seven and a half percent of boys in the United States. So that's all colors, all races, everybody. Black children have nearly twice the risk of sexual abuse as white children. Let that sink in. 
So what does that mean? All right, it's common, but what does that, what effects does that have? So this, these are results of studies, and then I can talk about kind of what I've seen, but childhood sexual abuse has been linked to a number of adverse effects, including hypersexuality, substance abuse, suicidality, and depression. And so I've talked about this too. It's, it's a known response that you kind of go one of two ways. Either folks go very outgoing and they're throwing their body at everybody and they're way open to all the experiences or they do the opposite where they're closed in and locked up. And the way I used to say it is clink, clink, like, uh, like in uh, Medea, okay? So either they're wide open or they're you know hard, fast, shut. They're both defense mechanisms. They are both defense mechanisms. Okay, so that's this is the uh, research and academic way to say the same thing. So hypersexuality, substance use, which is kind of the outward uh, version of that response, and then suicidality and depression, which is the inward version of that response. I was the inward version. That was that was how I handled it. Um, just kind of closing up. Um, Despite a plethora of research on childhood sexual abuse, little is known about its effects on how it affects adolescents, and the cultural factors that influence their coping styles. There was a study founded on social cultural coping theory and the model of trauma genetic, trauma genic, there it is, dynamics of sexual abuse, suggesting that childhood sexual abuse consequences lead to maladaptive coping mechanisms influenced by sociocultural factors. So this very, very fancy language, but what their, what their main finding was, boys were significantly more likely to use substances in a response, while girls were more likely to experience depressive symptoms and suicidality. Um, and that was, that was kind of their, what they saw in the study. So I mentioned earlier, and I'm, I'm going to share just a few thoughts. I have some discussion prompts for us to be thinking about. I'll open the floor. I also have a, a guest, which I'm excited to introduce to you all. He's new for us, for this community, um, to share about a solution that's working for him and his family, because this is not just about how we heal as survivors. This is about how we choose to parent. And if we're not directly parenting, how we're choosing to influence the people around us, because we have so much power in that, in how we model our lives, how we model our response to trauma. People are watching, young people are watching, the next generation is watching. So the, the kids that we parent and the, uh, the kids that we don't parent, but are watching. It's, it's important to be intentional. And so he has some really cool intentional things that worked for his family. And I'm excited to have him share with you a little later on what worked for him and how you can learn about it. So you heard me say earlier, and I'll get, in, I'll get into this in a second. So listen, listen with your thinking caps. Um, I'm gonna share these few thoughts, but after that, I'm gonna open the floor and I'd like you to be thinking about solutions. Okay, so this is not just about Sexual abuse is awful. It's worse in the Black community and other communities of color. Look how terrible. This is not just about awareness. This is about solutions. So I have some solutions in mind, but I want you to think about what solutions do you have for decreasing the demand for childhood sexual abuse? Decreasing the demand. Protecting the children in your home or in other homes. Cross persecuting offenders. This is the part no one really thinks about, persecuting offenders and child offenders, because not every childhood sexual abuse offender is, you know, a creepy man in a van. You know, most of the time it's someone the victim knows. In my case, it was another child, an old child. So how do we handle that? Uh, awareness among children. What does that look like beyond the stranger danger message? What does it look like? to have your child be aware of dangers. And I have a story for that that came out of yesterday. And what can civil servants do to people outside of our community? What can police, politicians, teachers, uh, clergy, first responders, what can community members do, civil servants do 
for this issue. So those are things to be thinking on. I will tell you, um, I my kids, I promised my kids to watch a movie yesterday. Okay, so my my 10 year old is wonderful. And she's asking things like, can we watch Harriet? Can we watch the Harriet Tubman movie? Can we watch Dirty Dancing? No, we cannot watch Dirty Dancing because she's 10. It's no Dirty Dancing, it's only clean dancing here. And um, <laughs> and, uh, and she was asking about, for real, for real, I see your face. Okay, that's, you know exactly which daughter, okay. <laughs> and And so I was like, okay, listen, you want more? And she says, she says to me, well, at least we'd be watching with adult supervision, right? This is her bargaining chip. So uh, I saw the movie Respect, which is uh, Aretha Franklin's biopic. And I said, okay, this has some mature themes. You have adult supervision. We'll watch this. They were not ready. And I shouldn't have done it because they were not ready. Okay. And I didn't, I hadn't seen the movie, so I didn't know what, what to expect, but there were, um, there was a scene about childhood sexual abuse, um, where they didn't show any activity, but they showed the setup where someone had come into a child's room while the child was getting ready to sleep and close the door and you knew something bad was going to happen. And later on, you saw a prepubescent Aretha pregnant, right? So that scarred my babies, hopefully not too bad because, you know, we talked about it, but it was a scary thing for them. And, and it's a fine line, you know, I want them to be prepared, not just for the good of life, but for the bad of life, but not afraid. Right. So I just, I just share that story because we're all, we're all learning as we go, you know, and I told them as they're like, I'm going to have bad dreams. I'm like, okay, listen. So the next time you want to ask me to watch a grown up movie, I'm going to say, no, we're going to watch cartoons. <laughs> they're like, okay. <laughs> but, you know, we all, we all learn it. They're not ready yet, but, but it's important. Like, even though that's a scary prospect and, and really uncomfortable and, you know, we don't want to think about bad things. It's still important to, for them to know, like bad things can happen. And here's what we do right? We don't just, and I, another thing I watch, okay, okay, I know I feel like I'm taking up all the story time, but <laughs> I watched uh, the documentary Shiny Happy People. I don't know if you guys know about that, but it is uh, Secrets of the Duggar Family that were on TLC, the 19 and counting, okay? So they kind of showed a model of um, homeschool and what I would call crunchy mom <laughs> or what is no, can be known as a crunchy mom but uh this this whole idyllic looking family that oh if you have biblical values you're going to have a quiver full of kids and you're going to homeschool them all and you know look at our magic system but there was uh sexual abuse going on not just in that household, but in their larger faith community, which they are um, showing to be a cult. That's how they're describing that particular faith community and talking about the horrible molestation that happened all throughout the ranks. Here's the thing I heard, I heard, and this is, these are white people. So this is not a community of color story, but it is a sexual abuse story. And these, you know, humble looking mild-mannered white girls were talking about grooming how they were groomed and how they were abused and saying things like well I knew this was weird but I didn't know it was wrong I knew this was weird I didn't know it was wrong so their internal you know their internal feeler was knew something was off but no one had told them that it's wrong for somebody to touch you like that and so as icky as it was for my children to see what they saw, um, I still think it was valuable because they need to know that's wrong. And if that happens, you don't just sit there and let it happen. You scream and you fight and you kick and you tell your mother <laughs> as soon as possible, right? So it's, yeah, I it's heavy, it's heavy, but I, I think these are conversations we should be having with young people and with the people that are entrusted to us. And I'm actually, I'm gonna pause here 
and just open the floor and see if there's any comments before I go further. Comments, questions, thoughts. Feel free to come off mute. You could also use the chat. The answer is never, never, never. When they ask again, I'm still stuck there. And then I had no, I had heard about the family, the uh, 19 and counting family. So that's, that's really, um, it's unfortunate and it's disgusting. And the fact that there are so many adults around it who are sanctioning it and participating with it and trying to pass it off as religion. You know, pass it off like God be like God will be okay with you molesting children because that's the thing that God was like, hey, on the sixth day, let's do no, it didn't occur. So it's a um, it just adds to the the existence of things under the umbrella that the word of God has been polluted to justify. So I'm enjoying the conversation so far, and it's it's, uh, it's definitely something that we need to discuss. So I'm about to be discussing it. Hey Dallas. Hey Scott, how's it going? It's going. It's going. Uh, thank you for being brave. Thank you for doing brave. I just wanted to come in early because uh, my phone is so tired right now. It may cut off midway through what you're doing, and if that happens, I don't want you to think that I just dropped off and fell into oblivion. Um, but uh, hopefully, I'll be able to get some charge on it soon because I know questions are my responsibility. But once Absolutely. again, thank you for for doing what you're doing. Thank you, Scott. I appreciate you so much. Um, in in so many of my difficult conversations, uh, it's your comforting force. So I appreciate you. So I want to share a little bit um, about how people are changed by sexual abuse. You heard in my story earlier, I said I gave you three ways that I was changed, right? how I related my, to myself, how I saw myself, how I related to God and saw God, how I related to men. And so this is, everyone is affected this way um, in these three ways, right? So thinking about how sexual abuse affects how you see yourself. Um, number one, there's definitely self-hate, self-loathing. Those are heavy words and no one wants to admit to that. It's not fun. It's not it's not fun to say that that's something that might be going on in your head and your heart, um, but it comes with the package. It's something to be worked through. It's something to be worked out. Self-hate, self-loathing, low self-esteem, it leads to treating ourselves poorly and expecting others to do the same. Now, we might not ever do that consciously. We do it subconsciously in how we treat our spaces and how we treat our grooming and how we treat ourselves, right? Putting yourself as the lowest priority and calling that loving others. We can spiritualize it. We can say, oh, you know, I'm just, I, you know, I'm a servant and, right? We can spiritualize those self-esteem. <laughs> um, in community, that might show up as suppressing childhood sexual abuse knowledge when you find out. Um, not reporting the abuse to others because that's just the way it is. Not empathizing with a childhood sexual abuse survivor because it happens to everyone. You know, I think about my parents and I think about what they've experienced, what my mother experienced, and whether or not she felt comfortable to share that with an adult in her life. And I actually don't know that part of the story. I know some of the things that happened to her. I don't know if she ever told or who she told or if she felt comfortable telling anyone as a young person. And what I also know, and we watched that movie yesterday of Aretha Franklin and how common, you know, somebody else raised those kids, you know, grandma and grandpa raised those kids. How often do we have that in the black community where, you know, grandma's raising a grandchild and that grandchild thinks that the mother is the sister right that's that's not just something in movies and Medea plays like that's a real thing that happens in our community sometimes you don't know your real parents you just know the people who raised you right um I talked to a woman 
wonderful professional didn't know who her father was until she was like 13 or something and there was a scandal and she found out about it which was great she found out before it blew up but you know my point is it, this is common this is common and you know the the temptation is to say ah oh, that's just how it is you know there's stories of men asking parents asking mothers for daughters men you know he asked me for you and i said yes some crazy mess how how did this get normalized how did this get normalized how did this get passed down how how are we just like being okay with this from generation to generation nobody says the hell the hell <laughs> this is not okay so obviously it changes how you see yourself it changes how you relate to god so in in the black community um christianity is the the cultural faith um so when you grow up with god uh judeo biblical judeo christian there's the word judeo christian god if that's inbred in your culture and sexual abuse is also inbred in your culture you expect god not to protect you you expect God not to protect you. Like God's clearly okay with this. For women in like, you heard my story. You heard me say, I believe God told me to marry the man I marry. And then we saw what happened, right? For women who God guided to choose abusive men. And I'm not the only one. Either, you know, you come to a conclusion, either you can't trust yourself, right? You don't believe whatever you know you don't you can't trust your god voice or god is cruel and wanted them to be mistreated wanted me to be mistreated wanted others to be mistreated and you almost feel like you're abandoning your faith to admit that to yourself to admit that that's those are the choices going on in your, in your head either god didn't mean this and i can't trust my god voice meaning I can't trust anything I hear, right, spiritually, or God meant this, which means what does Jesus love me looks like? What does that look like in situations like that? And many women leave the faith because they can't reconcile how a good loving God set them up for such a circumstance. And women who don't leave the faith um, struggle. They honestly struggle and all the people around them will just say, oh, God didn't say that. God couldn't possibly have meant that, but they didn't live out the situation, right? So it's, that's easy to give platitudes when you didn't walk it. And I know that I'm not the only one because I, in my own healing journey, I found a community of women who experienced the things I experienced. And there were some serious questions about whether or not God wanted them safe. Women who were still in the marriages, right? Does God want me safe? Is this okay? I don't think it's okay. I have to stay married, right? The Bible says this and the Bible says that. And I used to take those same scriptures and go behind platforms and beat people over the head with them. I sure sure did. <laughs> I sure did. So I, I know both sides of that narrative. And it's a scary thing to love a God you can't trust. In community, how we relate to God shows up as believing the oppression has more power than individual choice. The oppression of whatever, but in this case, the oppression of sexual abuse has more power than your choice to make a change. The oppression of the system of uh, the sanctity of marriage and how people honor marriage above, above safety, above people. Um, and believing that is more powerful, more proper to honor than your own safety. And then third, it changes how you relate to the opposite sex. Um, and I'll, I speak from the perspective of uh, a woman who was abused, a girl who was abused. That was my experience. But clearly it can go the other way as well. It, you grow up with an expectation of men are not safe. Uh, men are just out to use and abuse you. Like I said, I share my one experience with you, the longest of uh, my abuse, but not the only. And so I had an entire 
belief system and culture that I am still growing out of, that men are not safe. Men are here to use you. They're only here to get what they want of you. They're not interested in who you are, just in what you have, right? Expecting women to be safer, but that's not necessarily the case, right? We know women and girls abuse also, just as boys and men do. So there's no, uh, you know, equal opportunity offenders here. For enablers, um, I've been an enabler, my hands up. For enablers, only feeling comfortable or seeing yourself with project men. This is my air quotes. Um, you may also hear that as missionary dating. So they're uh, wanting to be with someone they can save, <laughs> being with, wanting to be with someone they can help, wanting to be with someone they can rescue, and not, re not being able to imagine themselves with someone capable. This period, somebody capable. You don't have to save me. You don't have to rescue me. You don't have to work for me. You can just be. They don't know how to just be. All they know how to do is work, right? Also, the idea of marriage is hard, right? So we hear that. Like we hear that from good, well meaning people in healthy relationships. We hear that from preachers. We hear it from authors. We hear marriage is hard. Okay. So the way abusers, uh, uh, abuse victims take that is I'm expecting my romantic relationship to be difficult. And so those are the partners I seek. Those are the partners that are attracted. Those are the partners that I choose. The ones where it's going to be hard because that's what I'm expecting. Love is hard. Marriage is hard. This is difficult. I have to soldier through. And even healthy relationships have difficult times. But the reasons that they have difficult times is because life is hard as opposed to marriage being hard. Life is hard, like regular life. <laughs> and when you're going through regular life with another person, there's definitely difficulties in that. It's inherent in the human experience. Not that marriage has to be difficult. And it's hard for folks to, folks in those situations to see uh, that marriage can be something else, right? So I heard that, I heard it recently. I was on a plane and listening to an, a book and I heard that, I was like, wow. And I know in myself, I've expected certain difficulties, right? And when you expect that, as a man thinks, as a woman thinks, so are they. So, okay going to open the floor and then we're going to talk about solutions. So for this discussion prompts, what are you imagining as uh, decreasing? What are solutions that are coming to your mind? Decreasing demand for the abuse, protecting children in their homes, persecuting offenders, awareness among children, and what can civil servants do? We'll open the floor for some thoughts and then we'll go back in. So allegedly, um, somebody, we're not going to say, had a, a, a superhero Avengers thought where we have our, our 1 800 come be the whole down um, dot com. Huh? Because some of these people just need their behind kick, you know. So um, I'm going to propose 1 800 um, be the whole down if you were coming to most of the Okay, so the beat down, down is your solution? <laughs> Uh, what's verified? Like we're not just gonna be leaving down people off of, off of a off of unproven uh, allegations. So once it's verified, somebody gonna catch them hands. We can lay hands on them afterwards too, and, and pray for them. So we're just gonna call it a hands-on experience and provide some hands-on experiences. But in all seriousness, uh, I do believe that is very true. Some folks just need some hands-on experiences. But prior to that, the the education, the the silence is, I, I think, what allows the amount of foolishness that goes on the silence the not preparing the kids they're too young to be exposed to this or they're too young to be exposed to that but when the, the truth of the matter is they're being exposed to things they don't understand can't explain and don't have a reference for it's like when you're learning your, your subjects in school you get your your theories and your concepts laid down prior to your understanding of what you're experiencing so there's got to be a better way to get that information out 
on uh, on what sexual acts are and the understanding of these are things you are not to participate in. And if someone is trying to engage you in that, then these are the methods you take to tell. Because we know how many, like literally between the two of us, we know hundreds of people, thousands of people who have experienced sexual abuse, but didn't have a clear tract on how to communicate what happened or didn't have an understanding that it was not allowed to happen, that it shouldn't have happened, that they were being violated when kids did not understand that they were being violated. They understood it you know, in their emotions and in their spirit and in the pain, but they did not understand it verbally and how to communicate what occurred. So I think that's a huge falling down because we do a damn good job of LGBTQIA plus education and how is it that we fall down at this is your body you are not to be touched in this fashion and if you are touched in this fashion not just leaving it one-sided because we'll tell you because there are said there are certain communities and homes where they do say this is your body you're not to be touched in your private areas da, da, da. but then they don't continue the conversation they don't complete it on the other side have you been right because some of those conversations come too late and then what do you say when you have and how do you tell even to the point of where um, we had because you know i work behavioral health from two-year-olds to 17 year olds right and helping to, to them to get lexicon in place to say hey listen whether we need to point at dolls whether we need to write little uh slide notes you know whether you're leaving out you don't want anybody to know your business it's in, in private emails that are on different numbers to call but equipping equipping the children equipping the children and having those out loud conversations because these kids know way more than we think they know. So that's that. Sure. And um, one more, only one more point I would add to that, um, including adding the knowledge to resist, the, mm -hmm. the permission to resist. Unfortunately, in, in many, um, many people who've gone through the sexual abuse felt in the moment because it was a an adult they had no right to say no they had no right to stop them they had no right to scream to to defend themselves and until an adult and until a parent tells them no one has a right to do that to you and you have the right to defend yourself mm -hmm. you have the right to scream you have the right to run you have the right to they won't know mm -hmm. they will simply believe that they have to take it from an adult. And I think that's, an, that's a very important piece um, that needs to be shared to children because adults unconsciously believe, oh, you know, they would know, no, they, they're not gonna know until you give them permission. Mm -hmm. yep. I literally mm -hmm. heard that on the on the documentary yesterday, Scott, um, a, a woman said, I didn't know how to say, I don't want you in my bed, get out. Like didn't, just didn't have the words for it. And it's so, it's so important, even though these are uncomfortable conversations to have with our children, it's, it's important to do it. Yeah. And I, I hear you and my phone wouldn't go very loud, but we did hear what you said. And, it's, and so that's what I would um, say in seriousness, in jest and in seriousness. Because once again, some of these people need a hands-on experience. With that, I'm complete. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I would hope, well, not. I don't have to hope. I know that. Oh, Sharanta, you're welcome to. If you want to type, you can type. Or if you want to come off mute, you can do that too. Hello. So my avatar is now going to start talking. Um, <laughs> so what I would say for solutions are definitely educate the kids early. I know for me, my mom had that conversation with me, which helped me understand that no means no. And that the boys that were touching me, it wasn't okay. And I did talk to the principal each time that happened. And that also allowed them to be corrected. And then them to also separate me from those boys that were doing that thing or protect me from those kids going into high school doing the exact same thing with the teacher threatening their musical careers and so I will say definitely saying something is like super important because it helped me out so many times where it could have led to an earlier 
physical assault, um, but that didn't happen until I was 24. And I will say is that I did report it and it wasn't easy. It was hard, but I did it because I did it for myself when I was a child and I had to do it again because if it was reported, that means that there's evidence somewhere that that happened. And if they should do it again, something else can happen now because it's a repeat offender. So educating the kids when they're of age appropriate, whatever that means to you, but making sure it is in their adolescence because that's generally when it's getting explored. It's after they've already really built their ego or right before they build their ego, either way, shape or form. And it's in the need to know of saying no, no to the private parts. No, 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 no to the private parts. <laughs> so show us that. Um, and then also when it comes to um, other solutions, when it comes to women is when I had to make the report, none of my girlfriends were on board with me doing it. None of them were the ones riding with me. It was actually my older sister that has already was assaulted prior um, and not the best way. And uh, she went with me to that appointment. So it's really equipping other people to say, if someone says this to you, what do you do? Or do you just like say, no, it's not important. No, you weren't physically assaulted. That didn't happen. And pretty much gaslighting you because it's already hard enough having to recount that story <laughs> at least 10 times if you're going to actually report it because they keep asking you. They keep asking you. And I'm like, it's nice to have a friend that could support you. So I would say that can also be a solution. Absolutely. And I actually, Charleston, perfect. You unmiked at the perfect time. <laughs> Because this, this, is, this is for you. So everyone, I want to introduce you all to Charleston Edwards, um, who is a professional colleague of mine. And I learned a bit about his story um, that he'll share with you. He has a book coming. It's not ready yet, but it's coming soon. Um, and it's really important. So his business is called Own Your Five to Nine. He, uh, he and his wife parent an interracial family. And um, I'll let him share kind of the background. And Charleston, if you can turn your camera on as well, if possible, um, that would be good too for the people to see you. Um, and if you could share your story and the solution that has worked so well for you and your family. Thank, thank you, Dallas. And um, I, I'll be the first to say um, I have a story to share. I won't say necessarily a solution because we're still a work in progress, but we are doing our best to live on purpose. Um, but just a little bit about me. Um, Zella just said, I, I founded an initiative called Own Five to Nine. We help families to live on purpose. Um, so we um, got into the foster to adopt system in the state of West Virginia about 11 years ago. Um, and we now have three daughters in our home. And um, one of our daughters, who's now a teenager, was abused, um, chronically abused, um, before the age of six. Um, she's now 10 years later. Um, we are seeing the repercussions of just how um, pervasive and traumatized um, um, this abuse is to her personality, to her behavior, to um, just how she is showing up in, in the world. Uh, um, and even today, um, we, it, it's just a daily intentional, um, I would say, choice to um, surround her with wraparound services to um, support her. Um, I think what we, me and my wife, has had to do is to um, learn daily um, around empathy. Um, parenting is hard in general. Um, and, and when you are parenting a child that's been abused, um, you have to come to them from that lens and just knowing that abuse at a young age, um, when uh, the brain develops so much from zero to four, um, just understanding how the brain is formed. And, and when you're abused in that developmental stage, it, it has lifelong implications. Um, and that is what we continue to get educated on, we get trained on, um, on an annual basis um, to um, learn more about where our daughter is at, 
how she thinks, how she views life um, from her view, and then try to give her those tools to so she can get to know herself. Um, so she's empowered to make better decisions. Um, so she's now 15. Um, we have a lot of hope for her <laughs> um, that um, that she can um, prevent a generational, and I think someone mentioned this earlier, that, that this what she has gone through has happened three generations up to her. Um, and what we've been told, this is a, um, a generational reenactment um, of some of the things that we are um, seeing in her right now. So um, a few things that I, I just wanted to share today of what we have done and where we have seen progress um, is, number one, getting trauma-informed. And you all have mentioned that already, just being educated. Um, and remain um, to get informed and, and seeking out information um, statewide, nationwide, um, through DHHR, CHS. Um, there's lots of resources to um, be trauma informed. Um, embracing communities like this, Dallas, <laughs> thank you. Um, this type of community is needed for those that have gone through it or um, have close loved ones that's near to it because it is a ripple. Um, um, our daughter's trauma is our trauma. It, it has implications in, in our entire family. Um, as mentioned earlier, wraparound services um, um, from the various types of therapy. Um, um, from a state perspective, we, we weren't aware early on of just how many resources there are out there to support um, those that have been abused. Um, just being able to call up your local DHHR, there are tons of resources out there. Um, for us as parents, um, we sought out a trusted circle. We needed a circle of friends that could we could be vulnerable with, that we can share with. Um, groups like this, where we can just open up and, and be real. Um, the the next thing that that and this happened two years ago, we proactively got our daughter an adult mentor and an, an apprenticeship. Um, we realized we needed more than us to pour into her. We need an entire community and a village um, to um, give wisdom, to give life skills, to give social emotional um, skills. Because when you've been traumatized um, from a social perspective, um, in a way, she is still a four-year-old, even though she's 15. Um, she has the intellect of a 15-year-old, but from a social perspective, she needed, she needed more wisdom and she needs more wisdom. Um, so we've, we've been very selective, proactive, screening um, who these mentors are and uh, putting her in healthy situations. Um, and then lastly, connect. Um, and, and this has been our biggest obstacle because one of the uh, things that she suffers with is RAD, which is a reactive attachment disorder, um, which is a unhealthy connection to um, adopted parents. Uh, so we've we've been combating that, um, just knowing she has that to find ways to be more intentional. And, and this is the premise of the book that I'm putting out of um, uh, focusing on family culture. And for us, uh, it, it is surrounding ourselves around our top core values as a family um, and taking those values and embracing one mission statement. Um, and when we did that, it just it, it, it was a light bulb that went off that we weren't being intentional. <laughs> um, and, and as much as we were doing for the last 10 years, there was much more that we could do to be on purpose, um, to live life um, with the focus first on our family, career second. And I know not everyone can do that, but it, it, it turned into a, a lifestyle change for us. It took two years to make some moves, to be able to create more space where we can be with our kids, where we can coach our kids. Uh, and some of the things that you already said of just how we can educate our kids, um, creating boundaries for them. Um, but all of that are around the family alignment, doing strategic planning, circling around um, values, and then living out those values. So your kids are seeing that, hearing that, um, and you're teaching them. Um, so. Those are just a few things that that I had on, on my mind, Dallas. Um, I'll give it back to you. 
I so appreciate you sharing, Charleston. What what strikes me about what you're doing is uh, being so intentional. As a professional, we spend time and energy strategic planning for the businesses that we're employed by, the businesses that we're running. And I don't know if that if that thought travels to, hey, I can strategically plan for my family. So I'm curious, you said it took two years to make some moves. You got really focused around core values for your family, a mission statement for your family. As you've been kind of rehearsing those things, what kind of changes have you seen? And I know you have two other daughters you mentioned uh, before this call were are neurodivergent, which is a whole different thing to tackle. Um, but how, what kind of changes have you seen uh, in your parenting um, in, in just your family dynamic after making these changes and kind of focusing around something strategic? I will say the biggest change, Dallas, is um, the stress level has subsided um, all around. Um, our kids struggle with stress, their own anxiousness, um, with certain types of neurodivergence comes with a fight and flight vitality, um, ADHD, um, uh, various types of autism. Um, that was playing out with uh, me and my wife as well, just because the stress that we brought home from work um, and having that that tug of war. Uh, hey, should I play a game with my kid? I need to cook. I need to do this. I need to respond to this email. Like it's just um, going around. But that lifestyle change has reduced our stress. I can now breathe. I can be more present. And if our kids need one of our attention, nine times out of 10, I can say yes. Um, and that's our goal. We we want to create a schedule in that space to be able to say yes, or at least one of us. And, and um, that is tag team. Uh, my wife's in the office. I'm homeschooled or I'm in the office and she's homeschooling. But um, but that biggest thing has been just being able to reduce the, the stress that is created by our own lack of time um, in space. I think another important thing you said was about building a village around your your kids. Um, and I think in the black community, in the lower socioeconomic areas, there is a village, there's an inherent village. Everybody's not safe in the village, but there's clearly a village. And I saw that when I got to um, starting to work in nonprofit, starting to work in youth development. And I said, wow, you know, auntie and grandma and cousin them like somebody's going to be watching the kids while mom's working somebody they might not be safe over there <laughs> somebody got them right <laughs> as opposed to like the stressed out mom in you know maybe in a caucasian community and upper class you know she's also working long hours um but they've got like the daycare and the television right so it's 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 different um, but village is so valuable. It's really valuable. Village of professionals, village of family, village of faith community. Um, it's important to surround your your kids with people that are trustworthy um, and people that care about them. And so I just I just applaud that. Um, as you heard me mention in my story, I was abused by a foster brother who was later my adopted brother. I am my parents' natural child, but I've had up to eight foster kids in the house at a time um, and kind of revolving door a little bit. So I know that dynamic. It wasn't a great dynamic in my experience, but it doesn't mean that it's bad for everybody. And to hear the intentionality you're putting around parenting your children is just, is admirable. So I do want people, if, if anyone else has a question for Charleston, or if you could share with us, um, if people are interested in your book that's upcoming, or learning more about the system that worked well for your family, how can they find out? Thank you. And I just wanted to add one thing. Um, even with the village, we still have to empower our kids. And and that's why I came off mute earlier because someone said earlier around empowerment. Um, and I have to say this, and I don't think anyone has said it, the word secret, right? Like that's just one tip. Like our our youngest kids is like if anyone ever says the word secret to you, correct them, um, because you just 
So we just those little tips with words that that something could be happening. You give them those words and a response so they can defend themselves, correct someone, work their one, two, three, and come back. Um, and thank you, Autumn. We don't keep secrets. We tell surprises, right? It's <laughs> uh, just one of those things. So I just wanted to add that, um, that even with the village, we continue to empower our kids in case we can't see it all. Um, um, so anyway, if you want to... Um, Follow me or buy my book when it's out. Um, you can visit owningyour5to9.com. Um, and I have a newsletter there. You can just subscribe to my newsletter and I will be sending out notifications when the um, book is ready. Okay, I put it in the chat. If I mistyped, please correct it. Um, but oh. Charleston is one to follow, uh, to be sure, to be sure. Um, very intentional and a man of wisdom. So if anyone has any questions for him, you're welcome to, I'm going to move the spotlight, but you're welcome to um, to ask. You can come off mute. You can put it in the chat. I'm very happy. Oh, here's a quick question. Mm -hmm. Did you put your daughter through martial arts training or did you teach her in self-defense classes with her wraparound services? Um, we have not, we have, um, been focused on a couple things. Um, there's a couple of disorders that she has. She's also seeing a, a psychiatrist. Um, so different types of therapy from a wraparound service perspective. Um, but when you do say self-defense, we are two youngest, just knowing um, the dynamic that's in our household, we are equipping our two youngest for um, self-defense classes. That's really? a really good question. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate that because I, I was listening to your story and I'm like, Jesus, um, this is a respite care worker. And yeah, yeah, yeah. We're just going to fast forward to the bottom line. The bottom line is baby girl was put through boxing. Like she learned how to box. She learned different um, veins of martial art, like yeah. defensive, like that. So I thought that was pretty awesome. And I just wondered. Thank you. And that, that reminded me actually of another question. So you said when, when the kids hear the word secret, they correct them. So what's the correction? What's the response that you gave them if they if someone says, let's keep a secret? Autumn said it in chat, we don't keep secrets. Hey, that That is the number one response. We don't keep secrets. We don't say the word secret. Even if it accidentally comes up the kitchen table for us. <laughs> one of us will correct each other. It's like, we don't tell secrets. And it could be an innocent secret. We just, it's just not a vernacular that that's welcomed in our house yeah. because we know it can go down the wrong wall. I think when you come from a family line that has family secrets, right, that, that have come out over time and that have been so, so damaging. My mom worked really hard to remove that vernacular, as you just said, from our vocabulary, even to the point where when my not yet stepfather, but stepfather, you know, I asked him for Mexican food, but he also paid me and said, don't tell your mom. I knew better. I told mom anyways, right? And she had a conversation with him and said, we don't do secrets here, right? It, it is something that, you know, I've just never, never spoken about secrets with my kids just because I didn't come up with it. But, you know, it, it is, it makes a lot of sense and it means a lot more when you come from a family where secrets were held and they were very, very damaging and have taken years to recover from. And, and in some regards still haven't right? It, it, it takes a lot of time. And we actually have um, a guest on Facebook who's saying the same thing, right? It's difficult when the abusers are in that village, right? When those of us who have a village and, and have abusers within that village, it's very, very difficult to speak up and to get the help that's really necessary in those situations. Um, and and I don't want to speak to somebody else's stuff, but, you know, it, it is very difficult at times when those people are so close to home. It's true. And, and, you know, when I mentioned, 
folks have a village, but the village is not always safe. And that's that's true. And that, you know, one of our discussion prompts was what can the civil servants do? So teachers are part of a village. In the homeschool circuit, that's eliminated too, right? But if a child goes to public or private school, there are people who don't live in the home that are part of that child's village just by default. So, you know, church leaders, first responders, teachers, politicians, police, people on the street, you know, what can those people do? Are the silent observers, you know, what can they do? Something that I heard my kids say, so Karen, welcome. I'm glad you're here. Um, I shared my story earlier, but in the tiniest of nutshells, um, my ex-husband and his mistress was trying to kill me. Um, and my kids were seven and eight, seven and eight or six and seven. Um, when all that was happening. So it's been a few years and uh, I hear my kids with each other saying, you know, don't tell, don't tell our family business, right? So I'm very public with my story. I've written a book. I share it frequently. My kids have heard me share it. There's parts that they don't know. I don't think they're old enough yet. They can't read my book, <laughs> right? But, but they know that I share my story and, and I heard them say, I heard my oldest tell my youngest, don't tell our family business. And I said, you can own your story, talking to my younger child. You can share your story. You don't necessarily have to share mine, but you can share yours. What happened to you, right? Um, and that's that's just one example. It's just one way, because I, I, want, I want her to not be ashamed. I want her to not be ashamed. And I know that there's strength and there's healing that happens, the more frequently you tell your story, the stronger you get. So I want her to be able to, to have that strength. Um, and, but just to hear between the two, like, hey, don't don't tell our business. Now you can't tell people where we live, <laughs> right? Like that's not anybody's business or, you know, and for safety reasons, they don't get in group pictures and I don't post pictures of them online, right? Because it, my story is not a, it's not a movie. It's a real life and there's a real person and <laughs> real danger. So, um, you know, there's certain precautions that we take at the same time. I don't want them to be afraid. So just, to, I don't know, just, just putting that out as, as commentary on, um, family secrets, right? We've all got family business and whether or not to share it. So Karen, I see you're unmuted. So I want, to allow you to comment if you have a comment uh, before moving forward. Um, I would like to say that the best thing, the only thing that you can actually do with children is to be truthful with them and give them that voice to speak. Because once they have that power to speak and to tell, then there's nothing that will hold them back. I have worked with children all of my life. I have worked with children who have been abused. I, ha I am a guardian at Lightum. So I tell them always, you speak. You don't ever hold anything back and never, ever, ever be afraid because that's what holds them back. And with families, I'm going to tell you with my family, I told my children everything. I just pulled them all together and I had a meeting. And we sat down and we talked about everything that happened in the family. And I say, no more holding back. If something happens, you bring it out, bring it to the front because otherwise you don't heal from it. You have to learn how to forgive in order for you to move on. That's where I've been in my life. You gotta forgive in order to move on. In the healing process, it takes a lot of time and it doesn't happen overnight. Absolutely. Thank you, Karen. And a, a, a wonderful coach, um, Jota Ere, that's not his, uh, he's got more than one name, but he says healing takes more than time. It takes intention. Yes, it and does. that's the voice that I, that I heard because I, I've, I've used it myself. Yo, I'm not ready yet. It's going to take time. It takes the intention. Yeah. And as we press in, that's, mm -hmm. it is still not instantaneous, but Time yeah. itself won't heal yes, it. it will. Yes, it will. Yes, it will. Yeah, takes that intention. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Sharente, we're going to go to you next. 
So one thing I want to add in um, is about being one of the people in the village. Yes, they have people at school and stuff like that. But I'll also say is that there were cases where something happened to a child underneath my watch and I had to make sure that parent knew what happened because it happened when I left a room kind of thing and I didn't know what happened until someone said something to me and I said oh I'm telling your parent just so you're aware and they're like no and I was like yes they need to be aware what's currently going on and if this has just happened we need to work on that because you don't understand what's currently going on here and there have been parents where they didn't want me to even tell them that that stuff even happened. And I'm like, wait, what? So I will say this is that if someone in your village tells you something, yes, fact check it, but also feel the gut feeling. If it feels like, oh, they're telling the truth or it feels like mm, suspect, do, do your due diligence. But remember that you have to actually be open and let your village know if something happens to my kid, you say something to me and it, it, you actually say, please say something. Because there are a lot of people that say, don't you dare talk about my kid and what's going on. Da, 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 da. And I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa here. I thought you, we want to make sure we're protecting our children. Yes, it might not be my child, but it's still my child because I, no one's going to touch a kid under my watch. Like if I can see it, no, not happening. But my thing is also making sure that the adult is actually open the parent is open to receiving something like that saying this is something that happened I'm going to highly recommend that you have that conversation absolutely it's so a part I don't I didn't necessarily tell in the book or maybe I did so my ex-husband um had told my children at, nearing the end of 2019 your mom's not going to live into the next year and it's a horrible thing to say to a child. It's a horrible thing, period. But it's a horrible thing to say to a child. And they went to school upset. And they told their teachers, my daddy says, my mom's not going to live into next year. And I'm sad. And, you know, I don't want her to die. Right. And so my my kids go to a Christian school. And the teachers consoled them and prayed with them and comforted them. But didn't think to tell me anything. Like okay, so I want to say I want to say they were definitely wrong because anytime something like that happens, you're supposed to make an incident report and contact the parent. That's all I'm gonna say. I I feel you. My social worker veins was like, what? (laughs) Like how? How in the world? And I didn't find that out until I was I was in danger until I you know there was a murder plot going on and a restraining order and DCF was in my house and like all the things were happening. And I, you know, of course you got to go to the school and tell them what's going on. And they're like, oh yeah, well, they did come in that day and say, like, oh. <laughs> I'm like, really? Hello? <laughs> oh my goodness. That's yeah. unreal. That's you know, it's amazing. It's amazing. So here, yeah. that actually brings up a great point, like a solution, right? If you're children went to a public school it may have been handled differently than at a private school or a faith-based school right and so is there anything out there saying that these faith-based or or private schools are regulated by the same required reporter standards as say a public school I don't know what the um what the terminology is there, but you just you are to report no yes. matter what you yes. are to report. You are a teacher, you report. That's it. Point blank period. Stay In based. Florida, every adult, every adult is a mandated report. reporter. Okay. Yes. And and I don't think that every adult knows that, right? <laughs> I, I know things because I know people who have taught me things, but I don't know that every adult knows that they are a required reporter in this state. That's a key piece that people need to know. Yeah, that is and, a key piece, definitely. But those were teachers. They should have contacted her. Yes. 
Yes, I they should have contacted me for like sure. Words like, let's go. Come on. <laughs> and they they did an amazing job. I'm not trying to throw them under the bus. All things considered, they did our family well. However, that was a really big mix missed cue. But yeah, anyway, anyway, we don't have to keep going down that road. But what <laughs> what I will, um, I really appreciate this. Um I really appreciate this discussion. It's been it's been really healthy. And so what I want to do is share a, a solution that we offer. So Malikia Courtney and I host a beautiful event. It's called the Sanctuary Experience, and it's a three day VIP healing experience for women. Uh, it is it is close. So we don't these events aren't large. They're intimate and it is intense. Um, and so I want to show uh, a brief video of the first of such events that we had. This one was from uh, 2021. And so some of the things we're talking about, creating space for people to be seen and heard and safely share uh, and receive love and building a community and building a village. This is what this event does. And not just the three-day event experience, but the community that's built between events. And so I want to share a little bit with you and let's see if I can share my screen and then I can't see you when I share my screen, but hopefully you can see and hear everything. Okay.
Hello, my name is Barbara and I had the honor and privilege of attending Dallas Cohen's Sanctuary event. This event has um, blessed me truly. It's given me an opportunity to step away from the everyday noise and busyness of life and just pour into my heart and my soul um, from the teachings all the way to the prayer and just the community with other believers. I was just blessed to be able to connect and it's such an, a wonderful opportunity to um, reconnect and rededicate you know, everything that you believe in and, and do that at, at a spiritual level. So I truly enjoyed attending and I'm really looking forward to returning again. Hey beautiful friends, my name is Hannah E. Scott. I was one of the speakers at this event, but I also had the beautiful opportunity of also experiencing it. And I just have to say, this experience was magical. There were many tears, so much laughter and healing and breakthrough moments that I got to experience with other people. And just the women who just came around each other in community was so beautiful so if you're considering coming to this event in the future or getting in contact with Dallas please do so you will not regret it it's such a beautiful experience and I was so happy that I come and I hope to see you guys at the next one bye all right so I love sharing those videos because it literally takes me back but your next opportunity to experience the sanctuary experience is coming up very soon this September, September 8th, 9th, and 10th. It will be in this West Central Florida area. And <laughs> so stay tuned for those details, but you can find more information about that and see more fun videos from other sanctuaries that we've done at thereboundcoach.com forward slash sanctuary or you can just go to the reboundcoach.com. There's a big sanctuary button right in the front and uh, that will take you to all the information you need to know. Or you can follow up with myself or Malikia Courtney on any of our socials and uh, we'll be happy to fill you in. It is a beautiful experience and it it is the atmosphere for healing, um, beautiful healing that happens and people go go back changed. And I know if you go to church, you hear that and it's like a phrase, but I'm saying for real, people really go back changed. They go back free and get freedom in places they weren't even expecting. Like they move in their purpose further and they're bolder and they're just able to show up in more power. Um, it's a beautiful thing. So if that sparked your interest, you can check out the reboundcoach.com forward slash sanctuary or get in touch with me for more info. And I've got one last uh, thought provoking question in case um, Scott wants to add in to questions, but here's my thing. Okay, y'all, we talked a lot about different ways that we can protect victims, different ways that victims can get help and healing. Yes, Charente is testifying over there because she's been to sanctuary and so has Autumn. Um, it's amazing. So, Here's my, here's the thing. We, we didn't talk about, we didn't talk about offenders. Okay. How do we address offenders? Not just people who've already offended, people who might offend, people we think might offend. So there, I read somewhere, you know, we all know someone who's been abused, but no one will admit we know abusers, right? Everybody says, oh yeah, I know this person was abused as a child, or this person had an abusive husband, right? But no one admits to knowing abusers. But if we know the abused, we know abusers. What is there to be done? I saw Autumn put her, her hand up physically because she has something she wants to say. Go for it. No, I was identifying with the fact that I know an abuser, i.e. my ex-husband, you know. Yeah, sorry. No, not don't have to be sorry. But we we do know these people. We do know them. You know, you think about the... Uh, was it it wasn't Elizabeth Smart maybe it was um where she had uh she was in a, in a house she was being held against her will for like years one of those situations and she got free eventually and ran to a neighbor and they made a meme out of his response y'all remember this y'all remember, I, I, I remember, remember what you're talking about yeah 
I, I don't know if that was, I can't remember the name, but I know the one you were talking about. Yes. They made a whole rap song out of his soundbite. It was hilarious and sad, but, but the, the point was, he was like, man, this guy was my neighbor. He's like, I ate ribs with this dude. That was, that was the line. Like I, who nobody had a clue. He had people locked up in his basement for years against their will. What are we doing about that? Is there something to be done? It's the question for the floor. I already gave you my solution at the beginning of the room. <laughs> to go lay hands. But I mean, we don't, we won't necessarily know. So until, until we see the person crawl out of the basement and cry for help, we don't know that there's somebody down there. Listen, you handle the pre-care. I'll have to, I'll handle the uh, aftercare too. <laughs> you know, so, so your so, question, your question is a provocative one because number one, how will we know? But number two, are we supposed to live in fear of everybody that we live next to on a regular basis? Like these are my neighbors. Am I seriously supposed to live my life in fear wondering what are they doing in their bedroom or what do they have going on in there? How, like, that's not something that I'm going to do. I'm sorry. I choose, I choose life. I choose freedom. <laughs> I'm not doing that. You know, did I hear Scott or Charleston? So, um, to your question, and at least from the perspective that I'm approaching it, um, the one thing when it comes to ab abusers, that I think that we can do is the more that we promote conversation, the more that we promote um, everyone talking and the more that they know the environment is a space where um, they are not safe because people will speak, they will not then have room and space to prey upon anyone. Um, I do not have a lot of thoughts, suggestions, or otherwise as far as what can be done with someone who is an identified abuser. I'm going to leave that for some other soul who uh, is more skilled and patient as to how they can be healed, fixed, and brought back to the fold. For me, <clears throat> my thought is how to give them as little of a hunting ground as possible. And the one thing they need, the one thing they want to know when they're when they're looking and quote unquote grooming is finding the individuals that they know they can keep quiet. So for me, the more they know and they see this is an environment where people talk, talk openly, talk often, check in, see what it's about they know y'all ain't the ones that's I what i would add okay i saw charleston on mic and then sharente i see you in the chat so charleston and then sharente yeah um i think there's more than one answer but i, I will give the perspective from a parent of an abused child we we made the decision to um Called cut off access um, forever, <laughs> um, at, at least till um, our daughter, you know, leave, leaves the home. Um, and it wasn't just the abuser; it was also the members of that particular family unit that allowed it to happen, knowingly allowed it. Um, which also has to be called out that there's an abuser, but then there's the aider, aider, aider the betters. Um, that um came out um so we we had to make a tough decision um in this particular circumstance for our child safety um so absolutely sharente you know i'm a kind soul but i am going to second malikia k courtney's appeal um, <laughs> And I'll also say this is that so when it comes to the court system, when it comes to reporting of these things, they treat the assault as if it was a petty theft. 
Uh, what I mean by this, I'm just going to be honest, is I was coaching one of my clients who was assaulted in a different state and moved um, across country so she can feel safer. She had to fly back to Virginia to um, go to court. And what they gave him was a two week jail sentence with 100 hours of community service. Wow. Um, so I would say that when it comes to solutions, I would say, I, I don't know, petitioning judges and let them know that assault is assault, whether it is sexual or physical, it should be treated the exact same way kind of thing. And if it's to a child, it, there should be higher consequences of the fact that the person needs mental health and they need to be separated from society so they can get that dedicated help <laughs> kind of thing. And I will also say is that when it comes to the abusers as well is to also if they're here, if it's crazy uncle, whatever, don't let crazy uncle, whatever, come to your house. And if he does, you call the police. I don't care what ethnicity that this person is. You call the police because they have to be removed because they are a danger to your children and family. So that's what I will also say when it comes to the abuser. Absolutely. I love all of these points. Karen, so, Autumn, uh, um, sorry, family, Karen, go ahead. Secret. And if, if the secret is not brought out, then nobody will ever know. So I say, tell on them. Make sure every child knows that there is an abuser in the family. And if they come near you, start screaming, start shouting, start kicking, start throwing. Period. That's it. I, I agree with what Karen said, you know, and it, and it needs to start from when they're young right? Mine are older now. We're past the stage where, you know, these conversations are a necessity, right? Our, our family situation has changed. But Sharente made a point, right? These people need to be separated from society and they need help. So most of the time, from what I've seen, these people are separated from society, yes, but where there is a lack is many times the incarcerated do not get the help or the services that they truly need. Uh, Department of Corrections does what they can to keep them fed and clothed uh, and, and out of trouble as much as they can, but the, the services portion of it, the rehabilitation portion of it. You know, Isaiah, my 14-year-old son, picked up something. We were watching SWAT the other day, and it was D-O-C-R on the show, right? Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation. And he says to me, he says, well, mom, he says, with dad, it just says D-O-C. It just says Department of Corrections. I said, yeah, because there's so many situations where the rehabilitation portion of it is completely cut out or cut off from what it used to be or what it in my opinion should be yes they should have services to rehabilitate them yes they should have counseling and all of the you know when we lost custody of our kids we were made to go to parenting classes and counseling and na meetings and you know all the things when these people are separated from society are they forced to go through these things no because these things are not offered to them most of the time and if they are they're so meager, I would say, right? They do just enough to get by and they don't really seek for true rehabilitation of an offender. So sorry, got a little bit passionate there for just a moment because it's something that hits really close to home for us. If, if I can chime in on that one. Go for it. I appreciate your passion on that. I think that was all I'm correct. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm moving around a bunch. Um, that was me, Scott. All right. Um, in my opinion, and this is also coming with a law enforcement background, don't have statistics. I'm just speaking from, from where I sit. The unfortunate truth is there are some people who can't be rehabilitated, regardless of effort and desire. There are just some people who choose evil. Um, and that is who they are. I'm not saying they're born that way, and I'm not saying God can't fix them. All I'm saying is that if they don't choose him, there ain't nothing we can do about it. And the fact of the matter is, unfortunately, 
um, because the way the courts are, because the way the laws are, you know, can they train them how to hold down a job? Yeah. Can they train them how to pay bills? Yeah. Can they train them how to be good, upstanding, moral citizens who will never prey upon another human being once they get out? That is an entirely different skill set. Um, you know, that that I don't know how many people can really say they have that they can download into some others. Uh, it's far easier. And, and I know this sounds very dark, but it's also very true. If you just look at the laws and how things are, are weighed, it's easier to get murderers to stop murdering than, than rapists to stop raping. You know, some murderers may spend a long time in jail or come out and they've killed who they're going to kill. They're done. You know, you you don't hear about some of the murderers who are living right next door to you. But rapists, sexual abusers, there's a whole bunch of laws about where they can live, where they can't live, where they have to register this. That, that. Murderers don't do that. Murderers, you don't have you don't have those things in place for. And I'm not saying it's apples to oranges, but but what I'm what I'm. I guess my frustration in this situation, because I completely agree with everything that is being said, the only issue is I don't know if some of the some of the individuals we were talking about are redeemable, at least by us. So then um, the only thought left is protection, because until I know that I can put mine around you and they're okay. They won't be around you and you won't be around them. And that's the end. That's just my thing. Ooh, heavy comments, but uh, thank you for that perspective. And to your point, when we, when rapists do get to court, when child molesters get to court, there's scores, you know, dozens of women who are coming forth you know, uh, even even if we don't get as far as as rape uh, in with sexual harassment in the workplace or something, by the time somebody gets to court, there's so many women coming forward because it's happened over and over and over and over and over and over. Um, Maliki, I see that you're unmuted. Did you want to add something? Well, it occurred to me too. Like in the course of our conversations, we have said um, the awareness pieces. But it struck me in the same way that we have the, well, we used to have a rehabilitation in place for corrections. There has to be some rehabilitation for parenting because, and I'm not, I'm not shooting at anybody. What I'm saying is we have so many things to distract us in life. Like life is set up that way. Our systems in America at least are set up in a way to fragment attention. And they are set up for us to abandon our kids to childcare, TV, um, curriculum, or curriculum, extracurricular things. So the village, right, we are, um, we are geared that way, especially single parents. Of course, I want us to call me out. Okay, let me see. Of course, I get a phone call, but the rehabilitating of how we parent, restructuring of how we parent and the attention like with having children, the learning that does not take place. We don't have anything in place that's like, hey, you're about to have a kid, come take this class. We offer, you know, there's a bunch of people who authored books and stuff. And then some are fortunate to have um, intact families so I don't believe in that minimal stuff, but intact families where they, they are able to pass on um, prudent information that will help with parenting. But we do not have something in place to educate the parents. And then we have uh, reactionary things in place. This happens, then we do this. This happens, then we do that. But the, the prevention, my ass. <laughs> that they're right there hmm. and then you have your parents who who have your oops kids you know your oops babies 
And then you're surprised, like, oops, the babies are for real, like, oops. And then you're surprised, baby. So, what a surprise. The child is coming, you know, that, that's a healthy, welcome baby. But even in that, like, we, we take time, we know to go register for your, um, I'm about to say dowry because I'm old. Don't tell about <laughs> register for your, your shower, you know? Like, we, we have these, these markers in place, but how many of us really encourage folks when they're putting that shower list together? to put this particular book on your thing or how many of us educate ourselves so that we are a resource to the young women coming up around us. So that's a, a pow pow for us older women who have younger women in our circle. Are we prepared to help love and educate and uh, be better about it? You know, there's so many fronts to fight on. Okay, but this is the one that we're speaking on right now. And I would say that the prevention and it has to come into play as a solution, like um, the eight really, because it's prevention and it's cure. Right? So we gotta create that, got to. And I think that would, that would help empower a lot of parents and, and teach them their voice. Some people just don't want your voice. And some folks, people tell, they tell their folks and they get those awful responses from those um, family members you know, be quiet, or that didn't happen, or he would never, that kind of foolishness, you know, if we have a society that is more supportive and more aware, that's why I wanted to do um, Brave, like this This is the reason I created Brave in the first place, so that we could have these conversations and solutions could be born out of it, so that's, um, we gotta do something better, I know that, you know, I'm looking around, we better do something too, that's what came to mind, I'm sure. I love that, and I think about uh, when you think about parents, like no one gives you a handbook. Well, like Malikia said, there's a lot of authors and there are classes. And I think about, you know, middle America, you know, middle income America and up and how that young mother, first time mother has Lamaze classes. I don't know if they call them that anymore, but, <laughs> you know, they have classes that you go to as you prepare for pregnancy and prepare to give birth. And there's books and there's, you know, community and there's official stuff. And, and there are women who focus on parenting techniques and stuff. I think you have to have a certain level of uh, your basic needs met to be able to have bandwidth for those kinds of thoughts. Moms that are struggling to survive don't have bandwidth for, you know, parental strategy. They're really just trying to make it day to day. And us villagers can come alongside and help as we can. And this other thought on prevention, which is a dark thought, <laughs> just trying to end on, but, um, but I think, you know, talking about prevention and talking about um, preventing abusers from abusers, abusing before it becomes that way. You think about pedophilia, right? Because this, where does this stem out of? It stems out of, you know, sexual attraction to kids. So from an older child to a younger child or from an adult to a child. So we talk, we know that it's shameful. We know that it's dangerous. We know, and we've, we put these uh, stigmas on these people and we have an image in our mind when we think of what a pedophile looks like. We have this, this typograph come up for ourselves. The reality is if sexual abuse is as prevalent as it is, childhood sexual abuse, if, if two of every four black girls will experience this in their lifetime, that means it's not just the balding fat white man in the unmarked van that is pulling up on the side of the sidewalk offering candy, right? There's more than that going on. It's, it's and we talked about crazy uncle so-and-so, right? This is going on all around us. And the question is, do people that that secretly identify? So you you know that every, you know people are not okay with how you feel, right? In the case of someone who has these thoughts or feelings, they know that this is not socially acceptable. They know that if they want to express this, they need to crawl into deep corners of the black web and <laughs> the dark web and other corners of society where they're allowed to do these things. But the question is, if they don't want it, now, not everybody will, like Scott was saying, some people, is, did they just choose an evil, they just, that's what they're going to choose. But for those that might be struggling, is 
is there any, are there any paths where they can say, hey, I need some help. I don't want to feel like this. I don't want to respond like this. I don't want to hurt a child. What can they do before they get to prison? Hopefully they get to prison, but before they get to prison, before they hurt the first child, are there any avenues? And if there are avenues, you know, we definitely don't make them acceptable to choose. And that's a heavy so thought, but I, I think it's an wanna, important. I just want to chime in really quickly. You know, these are adults that we are talking about that are abusing the children, but that child, what that adult was abused as a child. So there has to be some way we have to find to fix that when that child was broken. So this way, that child will not continue to break other children as they go through life. Because that's exactly what's happening. You're an adult. It happened to you. And before, it, there has to be some way we can, we can stop it. Because otherwise, they're just going to keep on abusing. They were abused as a child. And now they're going to grow up to abuse other children because it was done to them. So we need to find a plan, a purpose to stop them at that point and have them heal so that this way this behavior doesn't continue. Absolutely. And the same the same with older kids. And it's also very prevalent in foster kids, foster families, as it was in mine. Um, and I thought I heard Scott. Yep. Um, I'll chime in on this one. So are there paths? Yes, there absolutely are. And I, I would say, um, not every abuser uh, was abused. Um, some abusers that, that you know had completely quote unquote normal upbringings and yet chose this life. Um, there are things to pay attention to. Um, just like huh, just like drugs, just like alcohol, just like any type of addiction. Um, there are certain things to pay attention to, uh, not only in the personality that changes, but the things that they are involved in and being secretive about. And, and, you know, very rarely do you, let, I'm, I don't like making blanket statements, but when you have an individual who's stepping into some form of lifestyle of abuse, if you will, it's not often that it starts out with, well, I'm going to go drag someone behind a dumpster and rape them. You know, they may start out it, like, once again, when you talk about addictions, what is the gateway drug or what is the gateway thing? What is the thing that's, you know, it may start out with porn and, oh my God, is he, is he bad mouthing porn? And no one should, anyone who watches porn is going to end up becoming, no, I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is that individual becomes more and more obsessed with these things and looks for harder core things. And, you know, these are the kinds of individuals and, and I'm speaking from a certain place of knowledge of things that I've had to investigate as a juvenile missing, missing persons investigator and a law enforcement officer that <clears throat> the things that they fixate on aren't enough and they get to the next thing, you know, um, where they may start stalking, where they may start following, when they may start wanting to keep, uh, keep things as keepsakes, you know, and, you know, it, it, it's that personality that grows over time. Uh, and the weird thing is, like, we, we say, oh, there's that one in the family or that there are people who know. They don't want to say anything. They don't want to be accusatory. They don't want to. You could be intervening, okay, on behalf of this individual who needs to be taken off of this path. Um, there's a, um, a, a documentary or a movie out there, I believe, about Jeffrey Dahmer. And there's one, one uh, interview where it talks about how his father... Um, was arguing with him and wanted to see what was in a box in his room. And he said, let's not wake up grandma right now. I'll show it to you tomorrow. And he said, if I had just pushed, I would have found evidence of what he had been doing 
-hmm. And then, you know, everything wouldn't have been done and he would have would have been stopped before he killed so many others. Mm -hmm. um, because even Jeffrey had admitted if my father had found that box and what was in it, the jig would have been up there. Wow. Some of these individuals need someone to derail them before they do awful things. And, that, and that's just the way it is. And us being silent, us saying, oh, he's just quirky. He's just that way. They're just a little off. If you know a person is wrong in society, they need to be told they're wrong in society or else they're going to act like it's okay. You know, because they can get away with it. And that's the stuff that emboldens these people because they believe, well, since everybody sees me and isn't saying something, it's okay. The, the, ones who, the ones who they don't bother are the ones who they know will talk, who will say, who will call them out. So I, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop right there. Ooh, I just need to take a breath. <laughs> we all just need to take a breath. Guys, I so appreciate everyone and all of your perspectives, all of your sharing, um, the honesty in this room right now. It's, it's really, really important. And while we have a lot of distractions and things to like Malikia was saying to kind of split our attention um it's important to rally around things that matter and uh while this is is serious business um it's really important so I just I just want to applaud each and every one of you for joining joining me here on zoom for those of you who are on Facebook watching and commenting thank you for this um feel free to share this conversation with others that value this work and care about um, current or former victims of childhood sexual abuse. This is, um, it's not going away and it's also a conversation that shouldn't go away. So thank you to Malikia Courtney for having a brave movement for her birthday. And um, thank you all for joining this brave conversation. Um, I It's, almost 11 30 here on the east coast so that means we've been talking for two hours um and i want to give space to people who need to go to bed <laughs> so thank you thank you thank you each and every one of you if you have more things you want to share or any of this you want to you know you want to follow up you can get in touch with me uh, my info is at thereboundcoach.com or if you're watching on facebook you know, this is my Facebook page. My inbox is open. Um, I just value each and every one of your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being a part of this really important, brave conversation. And until next time, folks, choose life. We are wrapping for the evening. Choose life. Thank you for being brave, Dallas. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.